Hello everyone and welcome back to Real History for this final installment of our analysis of Apple TV's Masters of the Air. I am your host, history professor Jared Frederick, and here we are, the grand finale, part nine of this epic series. I've really been impressed with what I've seen so far. This episode that we're heading into, I believe, is the longest of all of the episodes, so I'm sure we'll have a lot to cover. Let's not waste any time. Let's go ahead and begin our final flight for Masters of the Air. Bombs away! The Observer newspaper in London had this to say about the February 3rd, 1945 mission that we see depicted here. The daylight raid on Berlin yesterday, in which 1,000 fortresses, escorted by 900 Mustangs and Thunderbolts, took part, was one of the most carefully planned offensives carried out against the Reich capital. 2,500 tons of bombs were dropped in 45 minutes. Objectives included many important military and government office buildings, the Anhalter Railway Station, and the Tempelhof Marshalling Yards. So dense were the smoke clouds from the fires started by the first waves of bombers that the later formations had to bomb by instruments. Anti-aircraft fire was intense. The two men who we see being killed here were actually substitutes from another crew, and they were Bombardier Eugene Lockhart and Navigator Lewis Chapel. And sadly, uh, both of those men remain missing in action to this very day, and their names are carved in the walls of the missing at the Netherlands American Cemetery and Memorial. An observer in a nearby plane had this to say about Rosie's plane. Aircraft number 448379 was hit by flak, reported to be a ground rocket, a few seconds before bombs away. Aircraft continued on run and dropped bombs. Fire and dense white smoke was seen in the fuselage in Bombay, including the cockpit. Bombay doors closed and then reopened. Pilot opened his window and peeled off gently to the right, directing deputy leader to take over on VHF. Aircraft headed northeast and flew for a few moments while six members bailed out. Three appeared to come from the waist or tail and three from the bomb bay. There was a small explosion in number three nasal and aircraft headed down, burning and beginning to spin when last seen at 15,000 feet. Observers believe entire crew had an excellent chance to bail out. And then, in a subsequent newspaper interview, uh, Rosenthal had this to say himself about this near-deadly encounter. Rosenthal, 27, and former lawyer, has made over 50 missions and cracked up three times, this introductory portion says. And Rosenthal notes, I was leading the 3rd Bombardment Group of the 8th Air Force on February 3rd in the raid over Berlin. My flying fortress was hit by flak before we made our bomb run. One of the engines was hit and caught fire. We were on the bomb run then, and so just kept on and dropped our bombs. We pulled out and headed east with a 100-mile tailwind. We soon saw the Oder River. Tech Sergeant Charles Weber of Elkton, South Dakota, and Staff Sergeant George Windish of Lewisburg, Kansas, bailed out. The pilot and the engineer bailed out next at about 15,000 feet. I pulled myself into the nose of the plane and bailed out. I saw the plane explode half a mile away. And you might also be wondering what happened to the fellow crewmen as it turns out their fates were rather mixed. Uh, we have Captain John Ernst, who was the pilot who becomes a POW. We have First Lieutenant Arthur Jacobson, who, interestingly enough, in a previous episode in this series, is played by Rosenthal's very own grandson. He becomes a prisoner of war. We have Lieutenant Stuart Gillison, who is able to evade the enemy, uh, records indicate. 
Uh, we have Lewis Chapel, who, of course, is the navigator and is killed in the blast that we just saw. Lieutenant Roger H. Strop, radar navigator, landed in Russian lines along with Rosenthal. We'll get to him more in a moment. Lockhart, the bombardier, is killed. Uh, Charles Weber, likewise, lands in Russian-occupied territory. And meanwhile, um, turret engineer uh, Duggar West becomes a POW. Warren Winters likewise becomes a POW. And George Windish, who was just mentioned, the tail gunner, likewise landed in Russian lines. And so we seem to have a very interesting mix here of people who were killed, people who were captured, people who landed in Russian lines, people who were able to evade. A real roll of the dice. By early February 1945, the noose was truly tightening around the Reich. Uh, the German troops defending the large region shown here were part of a hodgepodge of units that comprised the army group Vistola, which had been formed only a week or so prior to this. Um, a lot of these guys are really green. They are untrained. You have composites from all these different military organizations and units, and to make their job even more tedious, uh, heavy snow struck this area of Europe in late January of 1945. And then it melted and it turned the countryside into a sea of mud. And advancing through this was the Soviet Army's first Belarusian front, which was uh, within reach of the Oder River by February 3rd, the date depicted here. Uh, so it seems to me that this too uh, seems to be on the mark. These were essentially the exact words Rosenthal uttered to Russians to make it perfectly evident that he was an American. He also yelled out the words uh, Lucky Strike, the ubiquitous brand of American cigarettes that seem to be universally known the world over. Lieutenant Robert Strop, who was Rosie's radar navigator, had this to say about what happened next. I suppose I made the first contact with the Russians, he said. I landed near a wood and dashed in there to hide, for I didn't know where we were. Then I saw an American half-track coming down a little road, one that the Russians received through Lend-Lease, no doubt. Strop said he yelled, Amerikonsky, Amerikonsky, at the driver, but the cautious Russian pulled his revolver and stuck it in the flyer's ribs. Finally, he understood that Strop was an American and offered him a seat on the half-track. Rosenthal then continued the story. I landed in a field, and the next thing I knew, I was surrounded by Russians. I thought they were Germans and threw up my hands. I yelled, Amerikonsky. A great light came over the fellow's face. He put down his gun and threw his arms around me and kissed me. In the next two hours, I met three Russian generals. One of them had a citation from President Roosevelt. They were all very kind to me. I think we must have consumed two million gallons of vodka, and after the vodka, we ate four million meatballs. So, very hospitable indeed. Three minutes. Jesus. Back it up. Let's go. Where are the warmest clothes you got? Where do you think we're going? I don't know. Alice must be close. This hasty evacuation occurred on January 27th as the Russians were approximately 20 miles away. So things are just slightly out of chronological order here in the series as things are being condensed and rearranged. But my friend Jerry Conlon, my late friend Jerry Conlon, who was a bombardier in the 460th Bomb Group of the 15th Air Force, was among those who were there for this and was hauled off on this miserable winter journey that I suspect we'll see shortly here. Uh, so more on his story in just a bit. You okay, Solomon? 
as okay as a Jew taking a midnight stroll in Germany could be. Jewish prisoners were entirely right to be worried. At some of the other camps, several hundred Jewish prisoners were marched upward of 200 miles in this horrible wintertime journey to a labor camp at a place called Berga. This was not a place where you wanted to end up. And they were sent there to work in an underground armaments factory. And unfortunately, many of them didn't survive. Uh, so the advice that many Jewish prisoners in camps like Stalag Wolf III received from their comrades was to keep their mouths shut and possibly even throw their dog tags away to conceal their names or their religious faiths that were marked thereon. To my knowledge, I don't believe Stalag Wolf III was set aflame, but rather it was dismantled after the war. But all that said, this, this scene, it, it certainly makes for a frantic, almost apocalyptic environment that really fits the mood of this episode. As I mentioned in episode 7, I couldn't find any evidence of Howard Hambone Hamilton being incarcerated at Stalag Wolf III, but, and I, I, well, I couldn't quite determine where he was imprisoned, though. And so I asked for anybody to provide their insights in the comments section below. And uh, lo and behold, Hambone's own son uh, responded, and here's what he had to say. Uh, Hambone was my father. He was definitely not at Stalag Wolf III. Rather, he spent several months in a hospital in Munster and wasn't sent to POW camp until January 1944. The facility was Stalag Luft I in Barth on the Baltic Sea. So there we have it, straight from a family member. From here on out, you're going to keep that equipment hut opened and manned until wheels up plus 30 minutes. Yes, Major. This is what Crosby recalled of this very tense encounter uh, when he's talking about how uh, one of his navigators came to him and said he couldn't get a parachute. Instead of staying at their section till the flyers took off, the officers and enlisted men in the equipment section locked up and left, and my navigator couldn't get a chute before a mission. Enraged, I took the young navigator in my Jeep to the parachute shop kicked the door to splinters, and took a parachute. Then I went to the officer's mess, chewed out the supply officer in front of his friends, and ordered him to go back and repair the door. I wasn't sure about this new Harry Crosby. Kinder und Alte. Alles kaputt. This sort of dialogue represents the classic disconnect between young ideologues and seasoned veterans. And another movie that comes to mind where this is very much emphasized is a fantastic movie called Downfall, uh, which takes us into the streets and bunkers of Berlin in the final days of the Third Reich. That's definitely a movie that we have to analyze here on Real History at some point. Time for some show and tell. We can see that one of the German soldiers walking here in formation is carrying a weapon like this. And uh, this is a Panzerfaust. It is a one and done weapon. Uh, it was in many ways perfectly designed for green troops. The instructions were right here on the side. You perch it under your arm. You aim it at an armored vehicle or enemy troops. Uh, you cite it accordingly, and then you drop it when you're done. Uh, and so it's a fairly good representation that these green and inexperienced troops might be carrying something like this in the eventuality that they would come into contact with allied troops. This is also the sort of stuff that kooky history professors keep laying in random corners of their homes. Get close. Get close.
Moscow was well known for being a spa town uh, prior to the war. And this is where the men of the Long March, as it came to be known, bivouacked on the night of January 29th. And the accommodations of the previous night had been quite dreadful. And this prompted a number of British officers marching in the column to demand reasonable housing from the Germans. And uh, the men not only stayed in a brick factory, as shown here, uh, but also in some other factories, an old movie theater, horse stables uh, that were nearby anywhere where they could find shelter and get out of the cold for even a little bit. We can find a very appropriate description of Nuremberg in this latter stage of the war in Donald Miller's book, Masters of the Air. The war shattered another notion of writer Percy Noth's notions, the idea that there was a clear distinction between American and British bombing policies. In the spring of 1945, he visited an aircraft plant near Nuremberg that had been precision bombed by the 8th Air Force. Outside the plant, there was a housing development for the workers. The Germans could have moved the workers outside of these cottages from harm's way, but they did not. So when the Americans destroyed the factory, they also destroyed the workers' homes. And then Noth goes on to note, In some of them, a few people were still living, women and children of the workers' families. They were wild-eyed, dirty, and half-starved. By night, they barricaded themselves in cave-like ruins of their homes, fearing rape by passing refugees or soldiers. Their clothes were in rags. In some ways, they looked almost as bad as the prisoners of Buchenwald. So that is a very apt description of this sort of devastation that we see here. Now, here's a good Easter egg. As you see the column of prisoners pushing toward the camp, uh, far off to the left, you can make out a large complex with a stone swastika atop it. And as it turns out, Stalag 13 was located on the same property where Hitler held his massive rallies prior to and during the war. Uh, and so you see that huge stadium uh, there in the background, and I believe it's that swastika that's famously blown up by U.S. Army engineers at war's end. Jesus, I'll be. George, how the hell are you? Long way from home. Oh my God. This is George Neithammer. It's not made clear to the viewer how Buck knows George Neithammer, but in fact, they were old college pals from Wyoming. Uh, George had been a member of the peacetime army, and he, in fact, was shot down on May 31st, 1944, in a B-24. And like Buck, he was also a very athletic fellow. Nice tip of the hat here to his baseball knowledge. But um, here's the other thing. Um, Neath Hammer was actually in Stalag Luft 3 with Clevin for some time prior to this. They had been incarcerated for at least a few months together. Um, and in fact, uh, Neithammer's parents received their first letter from their son in captivity that January. And in that letter, it mentions Clevin by name and it indicates that all of the Wyoming boys of Stalag Wolf 3 were getting together to have a Wyoming themed Christmas party uh, within the camp. Uh, so, uh, this is not the first interaction that they would have had. They had been, in fact, um, living together for some time by this point. The Zabakoa concentration camp near Posen was established in April 1943, and it was intended to incarcerate 
political critics and political enemies of the Third Reich, and it, apparently they were going to be re-educated while they were there. But by January of 1945, there were over 20,000 prisoners there. So we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg in this introductory scene here. Zabakoa was evacuated about a week before Stahl Logluff III was. And while a lot of the prisoners were relocated, perhaps several hundred were shot and burned, which is what we're seeing right now. Oh, okay. The, the quote in Hebrew shown here says, the judge of life will judge for life. Very poignant. I don't know if Rosenthal actually saw this camp during his travels, but it's certainly a powerful moment given his own Jewish faith. And in his memoir, Crosby wrote that nobody could exactly figure out why Rosenthal was such a good combat leader. And a lot of the men supposed that Rosie had family in Europe who were victims of the Holocaust. But certainly, and we get a sense of this in Band of Brothers as well, when GIs encountered places like this, their reasons for fighting became all the clearer. That looks like a C-47 in the background, and this makes sense since the Russians received so much armor, aircraft, tanks, fuel, natural resources, medical supplies, you name it, from the United States. And yes, the Russians do lose the most of any country in the war, an excess of 20 million, but so much of their war making capacity was supplied by the United States. There's no line in the numbers. Uh, but sadly, um, if historians discuss that in Russia today, not to mention the many slaughters of the Stalin era, it can end them up in jail or even evicted from the country. So yes, academic freedom is a very nice thing. Oh, this is just heart-wrenching stuff. But uh, I, I, I wonder why Neithammer wasn't introduced in the series a little bit sooner. Perhaps you could have had him in the Stahl Logluff three scenes, somebody who was actually there, rather than somebody like Hambone who, who wasn't there, and then it would have created a, a greater emotional response uh, when his character dies. But... Uh, Neithammer likely didn't die this way, at least not alongside any comrades who survived. Um, if this had happened as shown, uh, Clevin or whoever was traveling with him would have reported witnessing his death. But in reality, Neithammer's death has had long been a mystery uh, to his family, and it's still shrouded in a degree of mystery. As it turns out, his remains weren't found until the fall of 1949. His remains were found about 
40 miles south of Nuremberg. And here's what his hometown newspaper back in Casper, Wyoming had to say. It cites that three other prisoners had been traveling with him at one point. Those prisoners were Thad Walker, James Lentz, and Don Esterline. Then the article goes on to say, when they came home, they reported that they thought Lieutenant Neithammer escaped in an attempt to make his way through the German and American lines on or about April 7, 1945. He was last seen in a small church in Birching, Germany, where the prisoners spent the night during their march under German guards out of Nuremberg. Many prisoners escaped about that time. It was on this last march that he was last seen, and to date no word had ever been received with definite information concerning what may have become of him. What makes this story even sadder is the fact that George's father died from a chronic ailment that afflicted him after his son went missing, and the dad never recovered. He died in June of 1945, never knowing what happened to his son. Uh, so, man, this is just a sad, sad part of this story. But as I said, uh, Neithammer's remains are recovered. He is laid to rest with full military burials, and you can visit his grave today in the Arden American Cemetery. Another man who seemingly escaped in Clevin's bunch was Wilbur Ehring, and he was from Dayton, Ohio. He survived the war, and he went on and continued to serve through the 1960s, and ultimately became a Brigadier General. Rosenthal's odyssey through the Soviet Union was a lot more political and cultured than this episode perhaps has time to squeeze in. Uh, the Russians had flown Rosenthal and a small group of fellow airmen to Moscow, and there they were received with considerable fanfare. They had arrived there on February 19th, and Rosie actually had a lengthy chat with the U.S. ambassador to Russia, Avril Harriman. And while he was at the embassy, Rosenthal wired his family, who thought he was dead, by the way, to inform them that he was very much alive. And amazingly, he also managed a phone call to Thorpe Abbotts, and he told them that he was coming back to his command, and a lot of them supposed that he was dead too. And keep in mind, that this guy had been shot down in France the previous September and was able to escape through the assistance of the resistance and made it back to England and still continues to fight. This guy has nine lives. This would have been something incredible to include in the previous episode, perhaps. This is just absolutely wild stuff. But anyway, when he and his fellow escapees were whining and dining in Moscow, they were actually taken to the opera, and they encountered, of all people, the Japanese ambassador to the Soviet Union. Uh, so keep in mind that the Soviet Union and Japan were not at war with one another here in uh, February of 1945. Not yet, anyway. It's still a few months away. And one of Rosie's comrades were so incensed by seeing the Japanese ambassador that he lunged at the guy at the opera and almost created a diplomatic incident and they had to pull him off, um, or pull him away rather, uh, from the Japanese ambassador. Um, so a rather wild odyssey that they have in Moscow. But after about a week in Moscow, they headed by train to Poltava, where they then boarded the first of several planes to take them back to England. So, welcome back, Major, indeed. We flew in a C-46 to Iran, and then same C-46 to a place called El Adain, which mm -hmm. is a Brit base, mm -hmm. and then up through Athens, and then Rome, 
and Naples. An Associated Press article from February 26, 1945 has a little bit more information on the journey that Rosie is talking about here. The flyers soon all got together and were taken to a captured German hospital at Newdom, 13 miles from Kustrin, where they were bathed, given pajamas, and put to bed. A Russian general sent a car for them when they were able to leave, which took them to Birnbaum. When the mayor of the town heard we were there, Rosenthal said, he really put on a show for us. I think Americans must be the best-liked people in the world. From Birnbaum, the Americans were flown to Posen and watched the battle for that city. The strangest sight, Rosenthal said, was a cart drawn by four oxen. An American officer was sitting on top driving, he said. The officer was singing and laughing with a pack of Yugoslavs, Frenchmen, and Czechs crowded around him. I asked him if he wasn't in a hurry to get back to England. Hell no, he said. I'm having a wonderful time. Let's not forget, too, that Crosby also had colorful interactions with Russians as he was helping to conduct shuttle missions. And like Rosie, Crosby was treated very well, and he was particularly impressed with the, shall we say, buxom build of Russian women. But seriously, they could have done a whole episode just on 100th Bomb Group interactions with the Soviets. Uh, there were some crazy journeys along the way. Because if you gaze into the abyss, the abyss gazes right back into you. This troubling thought that Crosby admits to is in fact referenced in the book, and I'm also reminded of another excerpt from Crosby where he's having a similar conversation with Colonel Tom Jeffrey. This is what Crosby has to say about that exchange. That night, I see him at the officer's club. He is pleasant, but distant. I think to myself, I screwed up. I have a short conversation with him. Crosby, did you hear Axis Sally just now? Yes, sir, I did. She said, today the 8th Air Force was out in force. They bombed Frankfurt. They killed 5,000 people and left 50,000 homeless. That was all she said. He looked at me and said nothing. How did it make you feel, I asked. He continued to look directly at me. I felt okay. It was our job, and we did it well. I took a moment to answer. I guess I felt okay too. He smiled slightly, nodded, and walked away. And thus, you see these characters grappling with this moral ambiguity. And as I've referenced in previous episodes, they did, in fact, have to embrace the very sort of evil that they were trying to defeat. And such is often the nature of war. And surely these men could be desensitized on a number of levels. Um, a story left out of the series was that of a strongly disliked officer in the 100th Bomb Group. And one crew knew the perfect way to get rid of him. They faked plane trouble. The abandoned ship signal was sounded, but everyone was in on the joke, but the targeted officer in question who was disliked. And so the guy bailed out he became a prisoner of war, and the 100th didn't have to worry about him anymore. And when it happened, everybody thought it was really funny. And I think only years later did people like Crosby think, oh my God, we tricked one of our own men into becoming a prisoner of war because we didn't like him. Now that's being desensitized. Ah, uh, and reference here in the background, I was hoping that we would have a more uh, conspicuous reference to it. Uh, we have the Toby Jug, a bigger version of it, more authentic version, what I have, of the jug from 12 o'clock high that sat on the mantle in the Officers Club. So uh, if you are a fan of classic World War II cinema, uh, that is something that you probably 
made notice of very quickly. And while we're in the officers club, these sorts of venues were often a place where you would see a lot of informal art, trench art, mementos, souvenirs of close calls. And we also see some really great leather jackets being worn in scenes and settings like this. Um, I, have, I have my own leather jacket and oftentimes these leather jackets were a means of airmen expressing their own artistic talents. And so the one I have here uh, shows the mascot of the fourth fighter group, uh, which was also part of the eighth air force. And uh, because I like to go authentic, I painted this one myself on the jacket. And sometimes I wear it on a uh, rare occasion at the special events uh, when the circumstances call for it. This moment is later described by Frank Murphy, a prisoner of war, veteran of the 100th Bomb Group, and he notes, Upon entering Stalag 7A, we were searched, deloused, and given a short, lukewarm shower. I was initially placed in a ramshackle pigsty of a building housing American Army privates sleeping in flea, bedbug, and lice-infested triple-decker bunks from which they were required to arise each morning at four o'clock to be sent on trains to Munich to clean up rubble from Allied bombings or to work on farms. They would not return to our squalid, vermin-ridden slum until 11 p.m. Officers and NCOs were not required to work. However, soldiers of private rank were sent out to work 16 to 18 hours a day. I have never felt so sorry for anyone as I did for these men, or as angry about their mistreatment. So, tough life here, for sure. We're getting a really big slice of the Allied coalition being shown here which I really like. It shows us that there is in fact this broader war that is ongoing. People from all corners of the globe, uh, and indeed uh, such was the diverse makeup of places like these Stalogs. So the big question here is, did Bucky raise the flag? Or in fact, did anybody raise a flag in such a dramatic fashion as shown here? And in short, for the second half of that, the answer is yes. And I'll offer a little bit of context from a recollection I found in a 1988 newspaper article. And this is written by a retired Lieutenant Colonel from the Air Force, and unfortunately his name is abbreviated in the article, and I'm not entirely sure of who he is, uh, but he writes, my most memorable moment related to our flag occurred on a Sunday morning, April 29th, 1945, at Stalag 7A, Moosburg, Germany, a POW camp where I was imprisoned along with 30,000 other allies. The camp, by the way, was built to hold 3,000. We heard the deep rumble of diesel tanks approaching, but they were in the valley and we couldn't see them. When the first tank poked its nose over the hill and the column of General Patton's 3rd Army tanks made its way to the main gate of our prison camp, a huge roar went up that drowned out the sound of all those beautiful tanks. This was freedom coming up the road. Shortly after our liberators arrived, a grimy, skinny, but smiling GI shinnied up the flagpole by the main gate. 
he tore down the ugly swastika of Nazi Germany and replaced it with the glorious stars and stripes. It was a moment none of us will ever forget. There were many hardened veterans in that camp. Some of them had been POWs for more than three years, but those tears rolled down their cheeks, and they were not ashamed to be seen crying. Being set free can do that to people when they have been behind barbed wire and don't know if they will ever see their families again. Although all this took place more than 43 years ago, the memory of that morning is as clear as if it happened yesterday. The camp and the village are yours. I will hand over my men disarmed in 30 minutes. Dismissed. Well, that's a satisfying moment. It's a, a great authentic touch that we can see the patch of the 14th armored on this officer who has barreled through the gate. And this scene is what reminds me of a really great story with my late friend, Jerry Conlon, who had been at Stalag Luft Three, he had been sent on the long march. He ends up here at Stalag Seven A. He is among the liberated, and he remembered just sitting back and watching the spectacle of all of it because it wanted to be something that he remembered, and he recalled that. An American captain came through the gate in a Jeep. He had a trailer hitched to the Jeep and a machine gun in his lap. The Jeep pulls right up in front of Jerry. The captain turns to him and says, Do you know McCracken? And of course, there's thousands of people in the camp. Jerry didn't know everybody. He says, No, I, I don't know McCracken. And in any case, the captain reaches into the trailer and he pulls out an orange and he throws it to Jerry. And of course, this was like the first piece of fruit that he had had in God knows how long. And as it turns out, Jerry later discovered at a post-war reunion that there were two different McCrackens who were at Stalag 7A and both of them had brothers who were part of the liberating force that arrived at the camp. And Jerry said at a post-war reunion in Chicago, these four McCracken brothers, <laughs> two of which had been liberated and two of which were the liberators, were sitting at a table to each other. They hadn't previously known each other, but now they were united by their name and their circumstances of war. And Jerry pretty much told me that not even the most outlandish Hollywood screenwriter could come up with a story as improbable as that one. And that was his memory of the liberation of this Stalag camp. You never flown a plane before? No, sir. Well, ever? Never. I took a boat over here in 43 and then, well, I never had a reason to fly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is this is a very feel-good moment of closure as everybody's being reunited and they're on this now humanitarian mission and it's worthwhile to reflect on what Ken Lemons had to say about this time of the war as crew chief for Skipper 2 I flew many times with Lieutenant Garrison and his crew including the May 13th Chow Hound mission. Many civilians had been trapped in Holland long before the war was over, and they were starving to death. Somehow the Red Cross persuaded the Germans to let us fly over there and drop in food to these people. We loaded down the bomb bays with pine boxes tied to the bomb rack. We filled the boxes full of dried food and non-perishables. The people put a large white cross in a field near the town for us to key onto. We came in at a very low altitude watching for the signal. I was along for the ride and would estimate that the height was only about four or five hundred feet. 
we jettisoned the boxes of food over the white crosses. When the boxes hit the ground, they scattered everywhere. I could see the people waving at us and running around gathering the food. It made us feel really good to be helping in this way. One thing that I am slightly surprised about um, is the fact that not many people are talking about or contemplating the possibility of being rotated to the Pacific. Uh, my friend John Homan, who I co-authored the book Into the Cold Blue with, um, said that this was something that was very much on his mind. Uh, there was every expectation that these airmen would be sent back to the States, a strong possibility that they would be trained to operate B-29 super fortresses, and that they would assist with the invasion of mainland Japan, uh, an invasion that, of course, never happened as a result of the atomic bombs, but very few service members realized that at the time. So there, there was this specter of this other war happening a world away. Oh, getting, getting a bit emotional uh, here at the end, uh, but this is, uh, this is such a, a fitting ending. Um, not only do we have this beautiful shot of the planes heading into the sun, another classic way to end a historical epic, if you ask me, but I think the kids atop the tower is very poignant and very symbolic for two reasons. One is the fact that a lot of these kids, as they come of age, um, they will be the ones who are preserving Thorpe Abbott's and help turn it into the museum and the memorial that it is today. And it's through these kids, in no short way, that the legacy of the men of the 100th Bomb Group lives on to this very day. Additionally, as we think about the bigger issue of the Second World War, we have to ask what sort of world are these children inheriting? And you know, if we think back to something like Saving Private Ryan and that idea of earn this, uh, how will these kids carry on the legacy? And I, I think that that legacy is pressed upon all of us, the viewers, as well. What are we going to do with this second chance that this generation provided for us? Are we going to build upon it or are we going to squander it? These are the thoughts that are evoked within me as I watch scenes like this. Oh, such a fitting photo to end with. Post-war photograph of Buck and Bucky, friends to the very end. I am truly surprised that Ken Lemons isn't featured here at the very end during the coda. And so with, with that lacking, I'll provide a, a little bit of context as to what he does after the war. He goes back to Arkansas. He starts a family. He has children. He later serves in the Air Force during the Korean War. He goes home. He continues to put his mechanic skills to good use, uh, spends a, a portion of his career rebuilding cars, um, and he, was, he remained very active uh, with that sort of mechanical and technical work for the rest of his life, and he ultimately passes away in 2004. As I've been watching this series, I've been making reference to Lemon's book, which is entitled The Forgotten Man. And um, the book is signed by him, and it's, it's something that I've treasured as I've been referencing the book throughout the series. 
And I think a, a really great way for us to wrap up our conversation on Masters of the Air is to read you the final paragraph from his book. During the writing of this book, I had times of laughter and times of tears. Only now, for the first time since World War II, I have been able to give voice to some of the memories. They are the things in this book that I had not even been able to tell my wife, but perhaps it's time for them to be told. It's certainly time for the men who work so diligently to keep the planes flying to have their stories told. What has been written is just a small piece of a very large story, and I hope that you have enjoyed reading about the ground crewmen and the 100th bomb group. And accordingly, I hope you have enjoyed the stories that we have delved into, the well-known and the lesser-known, as we uncover the real history behind the men and the events of the 100th bomb group. This has been a wonderful series. I think that it captures the humanity and the complexity of the key characters involved, and I hope our additional commentary has been able to offer some key context to understand better the men that Ken Lemons urged us to honor and acknowledge. Thank you once again for joining us on Real History. If you haven't done so already, please hit that subscribe button below. We'd love to hear your thoughts on Masters of the Air in the comments section below as well. Once more, I also invite you to check out my book, Into the Cold Blue, a World War II memoir that I authored with World War II veteran John F. Homan. A lot of the stories from that book I feel ring true in the series as well. I don't think you'll be disappointed in learning about his experiences. Thanks for tuning in. Until we see you next time on Real History, stay curious.